Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, Senior Science Fellow at Nutrient Ag Solutions, and I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to kind of talk with you about some stuff going on with the weather in South America and then dig into this North American finish to winter and start to spring and summer. So let's do this. Our first map today looks at the next 10 days, so through the 15th of February at total accumulated precipitation compared to normal. And January and early February has been great for northern Brazilian growing areas. After a record dry October, November, December, there's been rain that have come back into this area. It's really helped improve the crop in this area, and we can see that that's going to continue. If there's a drier spot in Brazil, it is southern Brazil, but the heat's not really on. It's not really excessive heat in this area, so the drier stretch can be endured for a little while. Argentina, which had a relatively dry last couple of weeks, plus some heat that came on in the last seven or eight days, all of that's about to end as a cold front's going to sneak up out of the south here starting on the 8th of February, progressing all the way through Argentina, delivering some rain to really put the end on what was a stressful time period. Overall, the month of January, getting into early February, has been a net positive for Brazilian output. And what we're thinking about here is that later this year, in April and early May, we'll have to watch carefully to see if the Safrina crop, which is going in relatively on time right now, if there's going to be a deficit in rainfall in this area that could impact the corn production. So I'll watch that every day and keep you posted on what I'm expecting there. But what I'd like to spend the bulk of our time today doing is talking about North America. And I really want to figure out what this spring and early summer might look like. So let's just start where we got to this winter. Across the state of Illinois, most places have not seen a lot of snow, especially in central and southern Illinois. But a big stripe over here in western Illinois to northern Illinois caught two of those big systems back there in uh, January that delivered some heavy snow. What it looked like after it was all said and done was this. This was snow water equivalent on the 19th of January, but extremely mild air has come in and melted almost all that snow. Now, there's a major benefit to that, plus the fact that it has rained. The last 10 days of January were extremely wet. Parts of the southern half of Illinois picked up anywhere between 2 and 5 inches of rainfall. And all of this excess precipitation that came in, came in on unfrozen soils and went right into the ground. And what this is doing is right now, the state of Illinois is, on the latest drought monitor that I had here, um, almost drought free. In fact, we only have one little stripe down here that still shows up abnormally dry. Now, our neighbors to the west are still quite dry. The lower Mississippi River Valley, despite getting a foot of rain recently, is still showing up dry. But the Mississippi River has been taking all of this in, all of this January and early February moisture in, where the river really came out of the basement here with those values, you know, two feet below low stage not two weeks ago. Here it is now almost 23 feet above low stage as all of that moisture slowly funneled its way in. Now, bigger picture things, what I will be watching most carefully from now through April is how this map changes over on the right. Because as we started this year, we saw the fall drought really showing up in our less than adequate, and that's kind of a generous statement here, but our less than adequate subsurface soil moisture. This is the root zone soil moisture map, very low. With all the precip that came in in January and early February, we've made a recovery. There are still some areas that have less than 30% when you look at, excuse me, they're in the 30th percentile, okay? So that's a percentile looking historically where we still need to bring up some of that moisture and we need to get more in place to make sure that this is something that's going to happen. Now, just to make a point here, our neighbors in Iowa, they're actually looking at a much longer standing drought problem. Over the last four years, some places in Iowa have built up a 30 to 40 inch deficit in their rainfall, meaning that they really need to see more of this precipitation coming through. So what are they expecting? Well, over the next week or so, uh, most of the action remains in the West where this past weekend delivered massive storm systems into the Western United States. We just don't see a lot of that kind of ejecting into the rest of the country. So our forecast, we do have a couple of chances of getting some rain, but overall it's relatively dry and our probability of getting some snow out of this pattern is still relatively small, primarily due to how uh, mild things are gonna be as we work our way towards Valentine's Day. So another way to look at it, that was a week long graphic. This is going out 10 days. And what we're looking at here is the precipitation anomaly. So comparing it to average. And most of the Mid-South, Ohio Valley, Mid-Mississippi Valley, we're on a bit of a drier go. Not no precipitation, but drier. I'm perfectly fine with this. We just need to recover some more moisture later in the month of February, getting into March and April, and we'll be in great shape going into spring planting. Now, the temperatures are still very warm. You know, from the 5th through the 10th of February, we're going to be seeing average temperatures that are going to crank up there some places over 20 degrees warmer than average for a five day stretch, which means we'll not have any trouble seeing 50 degree highs and higher across parts of the state. When does that start to calm down? Well, maybe the 10th through the 15th. 
We're going to dislodge some of the colder air that's been stored up in parts of Alaska. And you see it starting to come out here once we get past Valentine's Day. So there is a chance of getting some colder air once we get past Valentine's Day. But how long does it last and how deep of a cold air outbreak it could be, that's still yet to be determined. I just want you to know that we're watching for post-Valentine's Day risk of getting some colder air in place. Okay, that's the near term. Let's now spend a little bit more time slowing down a bit on the long term. The Climate Prediction Center released its outlook for February, and it's a very, very El Nino look to February. Mild north, cooler south, that's what you see on the map on the left, and we tend to be drier in the Great Lakes Basin. So, doesn't mean dry, but drier. Now, I was just thinking about this and thinking about the way that this El Nino is transitioning. At the end of January, beginning of February, it had already peaked and began to slow down. Now listen, as I finish up this video and we look at these long range forecasts, the speed at which El Nino drops off is important, but it's also important to watch what the cooler water off the Baja of California and the cooler water here in the Gulf of Alaska do. Can you keep that tucked away in the back of your minds? Because when we look historically at all of the El Nino events, which are the spikes up on this graph, versus the La Nina events, which are the spikes down, we can stitch them all together and say, well, what's happened in February when we had all of these big El Nino events? Let's just get all of them. And what you end up getting is this. When you combine together all of the moderate, the strong, and the very strong El Ninos we've had since 1950, what you end up getting is most of February favoring more mild conditions. We tend to get at some point a drop in cold air, but it tends to be colder more frequently down in the southeast. We also tend to be on the drier side of average. Not dry, but on the drier side of average. Which then begs the question, well, what happens after that? Well, what happens after that will be determined by the speed at which El Nino collapses. You see, some models are projecting not just a collapse of El Nino, but a complete resurgence to strong La Nina by summer into fall. And if we just take the bait and say, well, let's say that that happens, this is what you end up getting. We end up getting in you know, March and April and May and June, those months, we tend to get deep troughs of low pressure coming over the four corner states which tends to set up with a very active severe weather season. A lot of us remember last spring when on March 31st, we had a huge outbreak of tornadoes that went ripping through. And if you've heard me speak before, you know that we've stressed how Tornado Alley in the last 40 plus years has been shifting to the east with time. But here's the trouble. We may start off with a very active spring in terms of severe weather, but the concern would be that once we get there from June to September, that if this El Nino collapses hard, that we tend to actually get hotter in the summer and drier east of the Mississippi. See that? Drier east of the Mississippi, wetter west, hotter over the Ohio Valley and the mid-Mississippi Valley. So that's a scenario where we get a rapid collapse of El Nino. Now let's ask some questions about this as we work our way toward the end. First of all, if we come back to spring, how reliable is using El Nino as your forecast? Well, this is gonna kind of, I hope, just set the precedent here. Because what I did was I went and got every moderate, every strong, and every very strong El Nino and just said, well, what happened in March and April with the temperatures? Now, do you notice that El Ninos all have different flavors? I mean, look at this. There's nothing consistent. I didn't design this graphic for you to scrutinize every map. I designed for you to kind of blur your eyes and look at it and see that it's not something that's consistent. What year might be closest to this year would be 2016, which is the one down here in the bottom. But I'm still not bought into that just yet. And if you think the temperature variance is high, take a look at the precipitation. I mean, there are some El Ninos when they collapse that we have really wet conditions like 73 or 98 or even in 83. And then somewhere it's really, really dry, like, you know, 1988 or even 1992, you know. So it's a, the point saying that this particular El Nino's demise is not well known just yet. So what do we know? The one thing I think we can rest our hats on is that I that El Nino's epic collapse, I'm talking just bottoming out, getting to La Nina in a hurry, probably isn't gonna happen. You see, the newest data from the European models suggest a slower demise. And if you look at the ensemble average, it says neutral conditions by summer, not strong La Nina. And in that case, what you end up getting is this. March, April, and May from the forecast models. What they're predicting right now is a bit tighter windows in the national multi-model ensemble and also in the European model. In other words, a wetter than average spring. Now, tight windows aren't a problem for us. We find them when they open and we get in and get things going. What I'm not seeing happening on repeat is last spring's drought. Remember that? 
Even the statistical forecasts we often use to help supplement this, March, April, and May, not showing a drier signal across the Ohio and Mississippi Valley. Now, this follows a longstanding upward trend. In fact, for the whole Corn Belt, March through June since the 1980 has been getting slightly wetter. How much? About an inch and a half wetter on average. But there's a lot of variability, and the biggest variability comes in the precipitation rate. We're finding that throughout our growing season, our amount of rainfall we receive, while it may slightly be increasing, the variability, in other words, the frequency at which we're getting heavy rainfall, that's changing a lot. We're getting more of our rainfall from big one-off events. So what should we expect? Well, it appears right now that as we get through spring and into early summer, that it might be wise to think that if you are west of about the 95th meridian, that your risks increase being drier because I don't think this El Nino collapses fast into La Nina. And therefore that tends to put a dividing line somewhere around the Mississippi River, but maybe a bit farther west where we tend to hang on to wetter conditions longer. Now that's not a problem. That's good, store up that moisture because there will be dry episodes this summer. There's dry episodes every summer. But the thing to be thinking about here is that the models, unlike all the chaos from history, continue to put us into a wetter regime this upcoming year. Now, should we trust them? No, we shouldn't. We really shouldn't. But it's guidance, and I'm looking for consistency. And when we compare it to the statistical forecast of this, again, we do not see May, June, and July showing up with major drought risk. Can I add to you one more dimension to this? What about what's coming out from the from NOAA and the National Weather Service? Because this just isn't, isn't a model. This is actually uh, uh, humans influencing the forecast. Well, they've got March, April, and May on the wetter side of it. They then have April, May, June for us having equal chances. But what they do is they go into, you know, the end of spring, beginning of summer is they tend to keep it wetter east and drier in the Western Plains. You see that June, July, and August. And right now, a lot of the evidence that we see building in these forecasts suggests this. Now, can we predict it? Well, no, we can't. We just really can't. It's too far out to really say much. But I want to give you one thing to think about. We're going to watch an animation. You see, what are the most common symptoms of developing central United States drought during the growing season? Well, these two big high pressure cells that flank North America, they have to leave. Like the Bermuda High has to go to Europe or just get away from the East Coast. And it helps if the Pacific High moves around as well. And what that ends up leaving us in the middle is a big omega block that tends to drive a lot of heat and drought. That's what happened last spring. Now, what happens most commonly as a precursor to that happening is cold water along the west coast of North America and Central America. In nerd speak, we call it the negative phase of ENSO, or La Nina, or we call it the negative Pacific Meridional Mode, or the negative PDO. Now, I bring this all up because my last slide for you today is this. If ocean temperatures are our best lead indicator going into any growing season, this is what was just released today. Going from February into March, watch this, into April and May, we see that there's a lot of warmer water that's building up in the Gulf of Alaska. While La Nina tries to get going, but late in the summer, this is not yet strong. The net effect of this is the water here is not forecast cool, nor is it forecast cool to be there. And that's why these longer range models are suggesting that when you get out there to summer, they look something like this, keeping us in the stormy regime. Now, overall, that's good news. But if that changes, that's why my partnership with Farm Credit is such that we're going to give you that information and make sure that you have it. But that's what I got for you today. Have a good rest of your winter and the best of luck as we get going into spring. Thanks.